Christ is among us. <clears throat> he is and always will be. So in our religious education program, The Way, here at St. George in Birmingham, we meditate on the Eucharist, the Holy Mystery of the Eucharist, in November in our classes. And since our younger grade classes are meeting at home only, <clears throat> we don't have the, the space to be able to have uh, all of our kids on site. We've been doing uh, these short videos to kind of provide a little bit um, more information for our parents so that they can um, answer questions and provide some context for the lessons that um, the kids are doing. So we see very deeply kind of embedded in the scriptures reference to the Holy Eucharist, which is the center and the core of our spiritual life. Um, I talked about the Divine Liturgy last month. One Orthodox bishop once described <clears throat> the Orthodox Church, and, and as, as Greek Catholics, we would, this would apply to us as well, um, as the church that celebrates the Divine Liturgy, as a church that celebrates the Eucharist. The Eucharist is our, is our core and our source of identity, um, and it is from um, the, the body and blood of Christ, not just um, you know, a remembrance that is kind of a, a happy memory or a fond memory, but Christ present uh, in the elements of, of bread and wine that we um, truly find uh, our source of identity <clears throat> as Christians. There are lots of references in the Old Testament. Um, one of them is the, um, the manna that rained down upon the Israelites in the desert when they were starving, when they were in need. Moses prayed and, and God sent them this bread from heaven. Obviously, the fathers see a very clear connection, bread from heaven um, and the word of God who became human <clears throat> and stands among us, uh, giving his body and blood for us. Um, that the, the divine word from heaven being the, the new bread from heaven. And in Exodus, when you read about the manna, <clears throat> you couldn't hoard the manna. It would, it would go bad. And so with, with the Eucharist as well, when Jesus enters into us, he, it's not meant just for us. Right? We don't use the language that some Christians use talking about you know, accepting our personal Lord and Savior as if it's all just about me and God. For us, salvation is about the whole cosmos, is about the whole world. And so the Eucharist is not meant just for me. It's meant for the world, right? Jesus is not just my Lord and Savior. He's the Savior of all the cosmos, the healer of the entire world. <clears throat> Jesus doesn't go away. You know, so once you've received communion once, Jesus is with you forever. It's not like a battery that you have to recharge. It's one of the things that I had to kind of talk a little bit about at the beginning of this COVID pandemic when we were um, compelled to shut down completely, that, you know, we can look within at, the, um, at Christ who is present in the midst of our life. So we don't gather regularly to receive Holy Communion because we're running out of it. Um, we do renew God's presence within us each time we receive Communion. But as I said toward the beginning, it, it was in Lent when we had to finally shut down, <clears throat> St. Mary of Egypt is our Eucharistic saint, right? That in, in 50 years of her adult life, she received Communion twice. And, you know, the, the, the second time she received communion was on the night that she died. And so for 50 years, she was in deep communion with Jesus who was present inside her um, and compelling her to live a life of radical asceticism uh, and, and repentance for um, the choices that she had made when she was younger. And so Christ is present in us as well. And it is for us every day to come into communion with him, to spend time in communion with him. And so, nevertheless, every time we celebrate the Divine Liturgy, every time we celebrate the Eucharist, uh, it is a kenosis, right? A, 
uh, an emptying of you know, that, that God empties himself in an extreme act of humility the 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 immortal uh, unknowable God comes and is present among us in physical in a physical way that we can that we can encounter we can see and touch and taste and it is an inspiration for us a renewal for us to be canonic right to to empty ourselves for others <clears throat> as I said you know, not just our own salvation, but the salvation of the world. And so, you know, when when we point at someone and say, oh, I wonder if they're saved or not, they're saved through us, our prayer, right? That it's, that it's our work as the priestly people of God to intercede for the world, especially for the most sinful, especially for the most broken, because they can't intercede for themselves, right? It is for us to intercede for them and to pray, for all of those who are uh, broken by sin and stand with them as fellow sinners. So at its, at its core, at its heart, Jesus intended the Eucharist to be a meal. It's not something we just kind of think about. It's not something we just look at. It's a meal. We consume it, right? And usually when we eat food, we make that food into ourselves, right? We make it into muscle and bone and blood <clears throat> and energy and stored energy, um, which some of us have more than we need. Um, unfortunately, I can't share it, but um, I would like to get rid of some of it. But this food, this food makes us into Christ. But when we receive the Eucharist, we are united once again. That we, are, we are reunited once again uh, in, in the body of Christ. St. Paul says, you know, though we are many, we, you know, we come to the one, in the one bread and the one cup, we become one in Christ. We become members of the body of Christ. And so, as, as St. Paul says in his day, there is no Jew or Greek, there is no slave or free, there is no male or female, but all one in Christ. And so, this meal isn't um, an exotic feast. It's a very simple meal. It's bread and wine. Um, and today, these things are not necessarily kind of staples, um, you know, but in, in the ancient world, bread <clears throat> hadn't been kind of, you know, beaten up and had all of its, its nutrition removed, um, as our modern bread is. And so you could live on bread. <clears throat> it had all the nutrition you needed. And wine was very common, uh, sometimes not very fermented, sometimes very fermented. Uh, and, you know, they, they needed to mix it with water, which is why we put water in the wine um, to, to make it drinkable. But it was a these were common foods. Jesus wasn't trying to be elite or to say, I'm only for a few people or for people who can afford me. Jesus was saying, look, I am, I am for everyone. I am accessible to everyone. All you have to do is come, and, and I, will, I will take you in. And so we who, who gather, we the priestly people of God, by our baptism, we are the church, right? Um, the, the word church comes from the Greek ekklesia, which means called out or, or called aside. We're called to be out of the world, even though we live in the world. We are not defined by the world. We're defined, as I said at the very beginning of this talk, by our union in Christ in the Eucharist. We are a Eucharistic people. And so, since the word Eucharist means thanksgiving, we are called to be a presence of thanksgiving uh, in the world. Um, especially today, where there's so much anger and hatred and, and lashing out, you know, having a spirit of gratitude being able to exude a spirit of thanksgiving for all the good things we do have. Um, in all of this mess that we're all in, uh, you know, I know myself, I feel sorry for myself sometimes when I have to cover my face up and when I have to tell someone else to cover their face up and, you know, all this kind of thing. Um, but in all of that, all the stuff that we, that we may want to lament, at the same time, we have to be grateful uh, for all the beauty and the richness that we have. Here in Alabama, we have had an absolutely gorgeous fall this year. 
beautiful, long, lingering fall, lovely to be outside and to be present in all of that. And, you know, I could miss that beautiful gift if um, I you know, was so occupied on um, the stuff that I, that I can't do right now. Um, the simple pleasure of sitting on my deck and feeling the warm breeze go by. And so we are called to be the uh, Eucharistic people, right? We're called to be the priestly people of God. Um, in our tradition, in the Byzantine tradition, I am a concelebrant with you. I am not the sole celebrant, right? In Western Christianity, a lot of times they talk about the priest being the celebrant and then other you know, folks attending and, and be, being present and assisting, right? But we are concelebrants of the liturgy because all of us are the priestly people of God. And so I, through my ministerial priesthood, have a special role, a special priestly role in the community. But all of us are the priestly people of God. And this is the reason why we come together. You know, as I said at the beginning, we don't recharge the battery, the Jesus battery, right? So you might think, well, why do I have to go to church every Sunday? Well, we do because we are the priestly people of God. And this world that we live in right now needs us, <laughs> needs us to be interceding together as the body of Christ. That doesn't mean that we can't sit on our couch or stand in our icon corner and also, you know, continue that intercession. But our identity as Christians being the body of Christ means that we need to be physically in one place. And that is um, fraught right now. Um, since we have restrictions on how many we can have and how close we can be to each other and so forth and so on. So, you know, we know that there, that because of, of you know, conditions we can't control, uh, that, you know, we have an extended spiritual family. The, the body of Christ is kind of extended right now. But the normal way for us to be, to express that, um, that unity in Christ is to be together at one altar, um, concelebrating the, the Eucharist together. And that, as I said, that Eucharist is, is first and foremost food. And so the action of the breaking of the bread um, is one that is very deep and very rich. <clears throat> that Jesus took something that was common in his culture and even, you know, in our Middle Eastern roots, um, quite often when I go to someone's home, they will break a piece of bread and give me uh, a piece of bread as a sign of hospitality. That, you know, for all of these hundreds of years, since Jesus' day and before, presumably, breaking bread was a sign of hospitality and of love and of welcome. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, sharing life, sharing fullness, <clears throat> with um, with those who have gathered around our table. And so um, we welcome anyone who comes through the door. We, we are, are happy that they're with us. And, um, you know, this community certainly is very hospitable. But the Eucharist itself is, is um, God being hospitable to us, like emptying himself and, and offering... Um, him himself um, as we say you know we offer you your own from what is your own in all and for the sake of all that amazing hospitality that God shows us first in giving himself in his body and blood <clears throat> and Jesus says in at the Last Supper when the Eucharist was instituted do this in remembrance of me right he took bread that was part of the Jewish meal, wine that was part of the Jewish meal. And he said, now, this is my body and this is my blood. And you can imagine that the apostles were kind of, okay, what's going on here? Um, but they understood um, once Jesus had risen from the dead. They understood that they were, that he was giving to them um, a, a way to have uh, intimacy and and um, the presence of Christ <clears throat> and so <clears throat> we fulfill the command to do in remembrance of him of Christ um, in every Eucharist and the word remembrance in our modern sense of the word sometimes is misunderstood 
that we you know that it you know we think it means oh well you know Jesus did really nice things for us and so we remember it's like kind of having a picnic for him or something like that um, but the the sense of the word uh, in Greek or in Hebrew zikaron in Hebrew anamnesis in Greek is much richer than just kind of a wistful you know being reminded of something nice um, and so listen to what um, it says here in the um, in the divine liturgy remembering okay so there we are remembering remembering therefore this precept of salvation and everything that was done for our sake the cross the tomb the resurrection on the third day the ascension into heaven the enthronement at the right hand the second and glorious coming again okay so we remember like i just said all the nice wonderful things that god did for us okay but wait a minute the second and glorious coming hasn't come yet so how can we remember that well because the 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 force of the word anamnesis or zikaron in hebrew is more than just oh i remember that time that it happened it re literally means remembering putting back in front of us making a member again and so in the eucharist we are the, the the past events of our salvation and the future of our salvation are brought into that present moment when i talked about the divine liturgy last month you'll recall that i said um, that we begin the liturgy with blessed is the kingdom not blessed was or will be right why because in this present moment in the eucharist in the celebration of this eucharist <clears throat> the suffering and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of christ and his enthronement right all of those things are present in in that moment through the celebration of the eucharist and we participate in that by receiving it right and the second and glorious coming again so all of time is brought to the present not chronological time but the kairos right the 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 timeless time the, the fulfillment of time, God's time. I'm grateful to one of the monks of Holy Resurrection Monastery for reminding me of that distinction between Kronos and Kairos. He asked me not to say his name, so I won't do it. But uh, I'm grateful to him for uh, mentioning that because it is timeless time, right? I mean, that, that, that in this moment of the Eucharist, all of our salvation... The, all the deeds that Jesus has done, what he's doing for us at that very same Eucharist, and what he will do at our judgment on the last day, all come to that one amazing cosmic moment, powerful moment. It's so much more than just kind of remembering nice things uh, or having a, a kind of a memorial picnic or something like that. Um, it's, it's so amazing that in the celebration of the Eucharist, Christ is present in his in 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 the present moment in the in the past in the future and so <clears throat> i closed my book here let me open it up again so i can find what i was going to say um when we celebrate the eucharist the, we you know we pray what we believe so this is what i say in the prayer and this is what we believe about the eucharist so that to those who partake of these gifts, they may be for the cleansing of the soul, the remission of sins, the communion of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the kingdom of heaven, and intimate confidence in you, and not for judgment or condemnation. Okay, so when we receive communion, all of those things are there. That, that we're given once again the gift of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit who has brought Christ to be present in that bread and wine is is within us and is renewed in us and through that and the Holy Spirit is um, we, we become agents of the Spirit to to share with others now you may notice that I said and we believe that the Holy Eucharist is for the cleansing of the soul and the remission of sins well wait a minute I thought that was what confession's job was well, you're right if you think that it is. But 
God has given us multiple ways. I mean, he wants our healing um, so much that, that he hasn't left us with just one method, that, that any contact we have with God is, is healing, right? Heals our sins. And so the holy anointing, um, holy confession, of course, and holy communion. Now, that doesn't mean that you, know, you don't need confession, but this isn't confessions month, so I won't talk about confession or anointing just yet. Um, but I will in the, in the, in the time that, uh, when they come up. But we can say that, that God you know, desires our salvation to such an extent that he surrounds us with his healing presence. And in emptying himself, he calls us to abundance of life. And so, my brothers and sisters, we who are the people of the Eucharist, um, we who believe that when we celebrate the Divine Liturgy, that the bread and the wine truly become the body and blood of Christ, not just a symbol, not just a nice remembrance, but truly the, the body and blood of Christ present, um, just as it was at the Last Supper, um, celebrating the great gift of his suffering and death and resurrection. All of that comes together in this moment of the Eucharist, and we receive it as the priestly people of God, and then we go out of the church <clears throat> and share Christ's presence through the power of the Holy Spirit with all that we meet, hopefully. Um, and when we fall down and we don't do it quite as well as we should have, God continues to forgive us and inspire us that we might grow in the faith. So that is um, my best shot at the Holy Eucharist in a few minutes. Um, and next month we will continue. Um, we don't have a pillar next month um, because it's a short month for the classes, December. So I'm going to talk next month about depression from a pastoral perspective. Um, and so, especially since the holidays sometimes can be a source of depression for us, um, I thought it might be timely to do that. So until then, um, have a wonderful month and um, continue to keep your prayer life going, um, you know, especially in these days that are so crazy. Um, we need to continue to be united with Christ, our true God.